Okay. So for those of you who are not familiar with the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management or SLILA PRISM for short, we are one of eight prisms that span the state of New York and we are creating a network of partnerships as an integrative approach to invasive species management. The PRISM network was developed due to recommendations from the New York State Invasive Species Task Force in the early 2000s. The network is unique to New York State and is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund in coordination with the Department of Environmental Conservation and various host organizations. Slilo encompasses the five counties of Oneida, Oswego, Jefferson, Lewis, and St. Lawrence, which you can see from the map on the screen. We are hosted by the Nature Conservancy and we collaborate with our partners like the Cornell Cooperative Extension to protect our lands and waters from the impacts of invasive species. I always like to begin my talks uh, by explaining what an invasive species is and what it isn't. So an invasive species is any animal or even a microorganism like COVID for example, that negatively alters its new environment by harming the environment, the economy or the health of people or animals. So the term invasive species can be easily confused as there are many non-native species that are not considered to be invasive. For example, apples and many other agricultural plants are non-native species that are considered to be beneficial to our culture rather than harmful. There are also species that are considered to be a nuisance but are not invasive like the dandelion, for example. You may wonder why some non-native species are so invasive. And that's because when a species is introduced to a new environment different than where they originated from, they enter that new area often free of environmental factors that keep their populations in balance, like natural predators or parasites. In addition, invasives also often produce many offsprings, offspring or seeds for example, one adult purple loosestrife plant can produce millions of seeds annually. Invasive species also have attributes that allow them to thrive in environments that other species may not do so well in, such as poor soil conditions. So because of these characteristics, invasive populations often monopolize resources and spread quickly. There are many different ways that invasive species are in introduced to a new environment. Human activi activities, especially global trade, are the main pathways in which invasive species are introduced and spread. This is especially true with invasive insects that are often transported in material on cargo ships and in ballast water, and then unknowingly released to shipment destinations around the globe. Invasives are also spread by wind and water or animals, but the pathways in which invasives are spread by humans are often faster and farther reaching than by natural means. So the main focus of our talk today is the spotted lanternfly, Lycorma, Lycorma delicata, or SLF for short. That's probably what I'll refer to throughout this presentation. This is a prime example of how damaging invasive species can be. SLF feeds on upwards of 70 species of host plants. There, are, there is high concern of the impacts of SLF will have on New York's grapes, apples, and hops, which are each economically significant crops for the agricultural industry in New York and across the nation. New York is the second largest apple producer and third largest grape producer in the United States. SLF additionally feeds on forest species that are important to New York farmers, such as maple and walnut trees. SLF was first detected in what is believed to have been introduced to the US as an egg mass on a stone shipment from China, India, Vietnam, or South Korea. The first U.S. infestation of SLF was discovered back in 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Um, there's like a meeting passcode. Oh, someone's speaking. Can you mute yourself or do you need help? The meeting passcode is SLF, or no, I'm sorry, um, 
S-L-C-E-M-C, all capital, I believe. Moving forward, if you don't mind, please mute yourself and utilize the chat unless there's a specific question about what I'm talking about, just to um, help with flow. Okay, so SLF was first detected uh, in Pennsylvania in 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. The infestation has since spread to bordering states, including North Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia, Delaware, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Ohio, and New York. So this map here on the screen shows the current reported distribution of spotted lantern flyer fly in the US updated this January. I've zoomed in on this map and just done a snippet of an image to focus more on the findings in New York state. There are SLF infestations present in Topkins, Orange, Rockland, Richmond counties, which is highlighted on this map in blue. And then there's individual findings of SLF adults or egg masses in multiple areas across New York State indicated by the purple dots on the map. So the main mode of spread of SLF is through transportation by hu human activity as the F SLF adults can fly into open windows of vehicles, um, they can hitchhike on the back of trucks in the beds, they lay their eggs on nearly any outdoor service including gear that travelers may be bringing with them. So because of the high spread potential, the New York State Department of Ag and Markets have implemented an external quarantine to restrict the movement of certain items into New York from other states that have known SLF infestations. To further help reduce the spread, uh, the New York State IPM program has developed a checklist of items to look for, uh, for the egg masses and other signs of infestation. Uh, on your boats, trailers, RVs, uh, outdoor furniture, and building materials. And as mentioned, I'm going to provide a link to that checklist in your follow-up email, so you'll have that available to you. So the appearance of SLF changes depending on its life cycle stage. I grabbed this right from the New York State IPM web webpage. Um, so in the United States, SLF have shown to have one generation per year and have four nymphal stages followed by an adult stage. So the eggs hatch in May to early June and the nymphs then are black with white spots until around late July, early September when they transform into, um, or I'm sorry, until May and early June, the nymph nymphs are black. And then a little bit later, they transform into a red nymph with white spots just before they're about to turn into the decorative winged adults, which happens in the fall. So the adults are present until cold weather hits and then the egg, they lay their eggs in the fall and the females lay one or two egg masses and each of the egg masses can contain between 30 and 60 eggs, which will overwinter and hatch the following spring. So eggs are a good indicator of the presence of SLF. Females lay their eggs in rows covered in a creamy white putty-like substance that turns a pinkish gray color as it dries. And later that becomes a darker tan color and it starts to crack and resemble like it looks like mud. Uh, depending on the surface, the egg masses can be extremely camouflaged. SLF feed on the sap of plants and often swarm their host plants. So during the feeding process, they secrete a substance um, or honeydew. The sugar rich excrement, it coats everything below it, causing a sooty mold to form, which inhibits photosynthesis on plant leaves and the stems, leading to a reduced crop yields and it can eventually kill off the plant. An infestation can also make it very unpleasant for people to enjoy the outdoors because the honeydew emits a very foul odor and it can also uh, track stinging insects, which can make being outdoors very unpleasant. And another sign is what you see here, sap oozing from the tree trunks. Uh, that's, that's caused by the insects feeding on the, feeding on the plants. So that could be another indicator of the presence of spotted lanternfly. 
So as mentioned, spotted lanternfly lay their eggs on nearly any flat surface and they can easily hitchhike on vehicles and outdoor equipment. So during the fall and winter months, uh, you check tree bark, tires, any flat surface that exists in your backyard or your neighborhood for the egg masses. If you see the egg masses or if you see insects, please take photos, note your location and email the information to the spotted lanternfly at agriculturenny.gov. There's also an online form that you can submit, which I'll share a link to in the email. And you can see here from this picture, I mean, this is this is a egg mass just on the bottom of a railroad rail. So they they love to lay their eggs on metal and on tire wheel wells and on the tree bark. So SLF appear to favor tree of heaven, Alanthus, which is an invasive tree that is hardy to USDA zone 5A and can be found in many parts of New York State. Alanthus have pinnately compound leaves with a central stem lined with 10 to 40 leaflets and they emit a foul odor when crushed. Each leaf has a protruding bump called a granular tooth at the base, which you can see from the picture here circled. Uh, also, leaf scars are V or heart shaped and the bark, it kind of resembles the skin of uh, like a cantaloupe, which you can see from the picture. And like many invasive plants, Alanthus produces many, many seeds. The tree can actually produce up to 300,000 seeds annually. Alanthus are most often confused with sometimes with staghorn sumac and also black walnut. Neither sumac or walnut will have that granular tooth at the base of the leaf, and neither of them is going to have a very foul odor if you crush the leaf. So that's an easy way to tell the difference. So this screenshot here was actually taken from IMAP, and it's showing confirmed IMAP invasive observations for Tree of Heaven. There are presence records near Oneida Lake and Oswego, uh, within the Salilo region. <clears throat> to enhance early detection efforts for the spotted lanternfly, there is a statewide effort to recruit and train volunteers to recognize and report when they do find tree of heaven as well because spotted lanternfly seems to really favor that species. Um, and it's very likely that there is tree of heaven in other areas throughout the Salilo prism. It's just been underreported. So be on high alert for tree of heaven at this time, in addition to signs of spotted lanternfly. <clears throat> so the other thing that I wanna to talk to you about is we're really trying to enhance our early detection efforts for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. We are reaching out to this group today to recruit volunteers to join this effort. Uh, the New York State Ag and Markets Parks and IMAP have collaborated and have identified grid squares across New York State where volunteers can adopt a survey uh, plot to look for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven and then report their findings to IMAP invasives. And for those of you who are not familiar with IMAP, IMAP is an online GIS database that is used by volunteers and also conservation professionals to report invasive species observations and management efforts. So I'm going to do a live demonstration now. Well, actually, I'm gonna pause for a moment. Does anybody have any questions about spotted lanternfly or tree of heaven? We did have a, a question from Kevin about uh, tree of heaven, uh, asking whether it should be removed. Uh, so, at this time, Ag and Markets isn't suggesting removal of the trees. What they're wanting is for people to locate the trees and report where they find the trees and monitor the trees for signs of spotted lanternfly. There is some research out there and this has been the case with many other invasive forest pests uh, where cutting down the trees doesn't necessarily stop the front spread and many, many uh, examples actually worsens it because the insects are going to go where they need to go to survive. So they're just going to move somewhere else faster in most cases. That and since spotted lanternfly has so many different types of, 
of host species. Uh, in a way, it's almost better if they're feeding on the invasive tree of heaven rather than our grapevines yeah. or our apples or yeah. our maples or something else. So if you're cutting down something that they would necessarily be really interested in going to, then they're going to be forced to go to some more desirable plants that we may not want them to go to. Megan, I've got a question. Does uh, the spotted lanternfly uh, show any preference between male or female Atlantis? Uh, because a lot of the properties that I deal with where we're, you know, our, our, our Atlantis eradication program focuses on the females, obviously. Okay. Uh, I will write that question down because I haven't read too much about, about that okay. uh, through from our partners that are doing the research on this, but that's a really good question, but I don't want, want to answer it because I'm not quite certain. Okay. But that's a really good question. Uh, Nick, would you be so kind to just jot that question down? Um, I can put it in the chat, Megan, if you want. That, that would be very helpful. That way I just don't forget about it. But I will, I will um, follow up on that. Thank you, Brent. Are there any other questions? Okay. So I'm going to switch my screen here. Okay. So this next session is just going to be a live demonstration of a few things that I wanna share with you, a few um, website resources, and then also how to use the IMAP invasives.org uh, platform and get involved in the statewide adopt a grid square program that I mentioned. So to begin, I would really like to share with you uh, the Slilo Prism website. So sliloinvasives.org, if you visit that website and then you go to the volunteer tab and click the invasive species volunteer surveillance networks tab, I'm looking here because I have two screens. So <laughs> uh, if you do that, it'll bring you to this screen here. And this is our story map. And we have some species, some information about what it is, how you can help and get involved. But what I wanna show you is that we have a tab all about spotted lanternfly in Tree of Heaven. <clears throat> so you can use this as a resource uh, in a couple different ways. There are links to different parts of our website that do give you more information about the species by the lantern flying tree of heaven. And then also the map is interactive. So you can move the map around, zoom in. And what's on the map for the spotted lanternfly tab are locations of known uh, confirmed observations in IMAP for tree of heaven. So you can go ahead and use this tool here if you're wanting to do some survey efforts uh, and you happen to be nearby any of these areas, you can zoom right in on those areas and go and check out the trees that have already been reported. So that's a useful tool. Uh, also, what I wanna show you is, as mentioned, SLILO is aiding the statewide effort for the early detection of SLF and Tree of Heaven. So what we're trying to do are recruit volunteers to join the SLILO PRISM Invasive Species Volunteer Surveillance Network. And you can do that very easily you just fill out this online form that's right here on this website. And then I know that you have interest in participating and I can add you to correspondence that is providing updates on the species of interest that you've signed up for. And you'll just, you'll be in the, in the knowledge pipeline, if you will, for the species. All right, the next thing I want to talk to you about is IMAP. So first step is making an account. Uh, many of you, when you registered, you may have noticed that it, there was a question there asking if you use IMAP and if you have never used it before, visit this, the website, make an account. So if you haven't done that yet, go ahead and do that at your earliest convenience. I'm more than happy to uh, assist you if you have problems or you can just follow along today. So you just go to uh, nyimapinvasive.org. Uh, you hit the login button on the top hand corner and then it brings you to this this site here, which is the login site. And you can sign up down here just by filling in your information. Um, the jurisdiction will be New York. And that will be how you, that, that will be your credentials to get into your IMAP account. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just sign in. Oh, I don't want a capital.
So there's a desktop version, which is what I'm showing you now. And then in a little while, I'll show you uh, the mobile app version for your mobile device, like a smartphone or, or tablet. So this is what it looks like when you first come on. There's a lot of different things that you can do with this tool. Uh, it's mainly used as a way to better strategize uh, invasive species management. It is used by professionals and it's also used by community scientists alike. So it's a great community science tool to get involved. Um, there's lots of different things you can do here. What you're seeing now are just uh, a bunch of different records here. You're seeing confirmed and unconfirmed species presence. So I like to just toggle that off so it looks a little less busy. <laughs> Um, you can zoom in and out on an area that you're wanting to uh, investigate. So what I'm going to do here is just very simple. I'm just going to show you how to make an observation using the online tool. I'm not going to get into all the other tools because there are self-serve tutorials and documents available on the IMAP website, which I'll share with you in the email. So we could just type in... Um, or now you can you can use this over here and type in an address or a location. I'm going to put in the cooperative extension. Oh, maybe not. I found it the other day. I don't know why it's not coming up. Cooperative extension. Just the north. It's oh, this one. This one. Yep, you can use that. Okay. All right, cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so that'll let you zoom in on the area. And then to create a record, you just hit the create a record on the top. Uh, you can do a presence, which is most likely, hang on one second. Sorry about that. I share an office space with my cat. <laughs> so she needed to get in. All right, so you could do a presence record, which is just if you're out on a walk and you're like, oh, I see something that I want to report. That's what you do there. And if you're involved in treatment, you can also use it to make a treatment record. And if you're uh, involved in some early detection and you want to say, I looked in this area, but I did not find what I was looking for, then you can do a not detected record. And if you're doing a uh, a survey of a larger area, you can do a multi-record searched area. But I'm just going to show the presence air, uh, record for today's talk. You could do a point or a line or a polygon, but for just a single presence record, you just do a point. You can also enter coordinates, which is helpful if you're um, out in the field and you're taking notes, for example, say you don't have a, a smart phone or mobile device, uh, you just have good old fashioned pen and paper and a way to get your GPS coordinates, that's fine. Uh, you just would record them down and then when you got back to a computer, you could go ahead and enter those coordinates into here and get to your exact spot that, that way too. All right, so we'll do, oops, point. Um, you know, you can just do a point right here on the map. And there's your point. Um, if you want to redraw, you can. If you want to do like a buffer, you can. You can, you know, add a my like a few feet if you want. If it was a bigger infestation, you could do that. But I'm not going to do that right now. I don't know why it kicked me out. Sorry. All right. Next. Okay. And then what it will ask is, what are you reporting? So you can type in, I'm gonna type in fake species for now because I'm just showing you, but you could type in other things or you could just go through the long list of all of the species that are listed in New York State. <clears throat> if you're part of a special project, which I highly suggest any of you that are interested in getting involved in this effort, become a member of the Slilo Prism Spotted Lantern Fly Monitoring Project, which I will show you how to do that in a little while. Um, but if you're a part of that project, it will come up here. Um, there it is. I'll have to add you so you won't see that right now. So we'll just add that. And what that does is it helps 
it helps me uh, organize and analyze the observation data for spotted lanternfly and other species that we have a monitoring project for easier. And it just, it makes it just more helpful uh, for querying the information. Then you could add your photos. You just hit that and then go into your photo area on your computer. You can write information of like how many of the species that you found. You can write information about how dense the state dense the population is which is helpful you can put in comments here something like um that helps explain how the infestation is impacting the environment that you're in would be helpful there's also advanced details here that you could really get into um you could be explaining if you're doing a monitoring and assessment situation if you're following up after after a survey that you've done in the past and this is helpful when you're putting together reports for certain areas that you're surveying and again more information down here uh, if you're using biocontrol this is more for if you're doing some type of treatment <clears throat> so this is a very simple observation here you just when you're done putting all the information in, you just hit complete and it saves the data. And if down here, it'll say, so the, the organization that you're tagged with, and if you wanna update anything, you just go into the searched area record and it just brings you to what other, like if I'm the project manager, this is what I would see when you submitted an observation to the project with your details instead of mine. Megan, we have a, a question about using IMAP invasives for just New York. So uh, can can you use IMAP for other? Yeah, there's other uh, states. So um, let me see if I can find where they are. Get out of here. Here. Hang on one second. All right, so you can create a record. Actually here, I think if we do filter records here. So the jurisdiction. Okay, so these are the other states, Alabama, Alaska, Alberta, Arizona, and there's a bunch of states um, that you could do the jurisdiction in. Actually, I don't think that's right. I thought it was just Florida and a couple other. Yeah, see. I know it's Florida. I don't think that that's right. Um, and I know Florida is one of them, and I forget the other states that you can do it in. Is that what you're asking? Like, if you're not in New York State, like, can you use IMAP? Yep, it's all the info and websites for New York only. So this right here is the New York IMAP Invasives website. There's other websites for other states that are using IMAP too, but for, for us, since we're in New York, this is the one we're using. Does that answer your question? They are in PA. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that there's a Pennsylvania one too. I can get more information on that because all I've ever used is the New York IMAP invasives. I think it's just a matter of going to the right um, URL and choosing the right jurisdiction. And I know someone else asked about Canada too, like yep. in an email or earlier on or something. And yep. I'll have to reach out to the IMAP team and ask them about Canada. <laughs> that was so. um, Ontario. They were in Ottawa. Yeah. So I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, okay. So one other question. Yeah. Can you add more than one photo? <sighs> That's one thing that they're trying to make it so you can add more than one photo. And I think that they've updated it so you can now. Um, I know you can upload more than one photo on the desktop version, but on the mobile app, I, I know it was something that was being worked on and I'm not sure if it's happened yet. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to show you here, so to join, join the project the, that I mentioned earlier, the Spotted Lanternfly Slilo project, you can, once you're signed in, you just go over here to the three dashes, open projects. 
and it might look different for me since I have so many projects. Um, all right, so these must be all of the places because there's an awful lot, there's much more than what I remember in the past. So there are many other states that are use, utilizing IMAP. It looks like, okay. So I'm gonna select New York and then you can just search um, spotted lantern fly and you see SLILO spotted lantern fly monitoring come up. I'm gonna pick one that I'm not an admin of because it won't show you the button that you need to see. So I'm just gonna pick this one. And then you just hit request to join project. And then I get an email notification saying that you wanna join the project. And then I just like, I add you and then you're part of it. And then later on when you're making observations under the project section that I showed you earlier, when you're making the observation, you'll see it pop up and you can choose it as an option. All right, so the other thing I wanted to show you So the big statewide early detection effort that I've mentioned a few times is there's a website or a web page for it on the IMAP Invasives website. <clears throat> if you just go to their main site, you'll see this little spotted lanternfly icon. You can just click right on it and it brings you right to the page. And this page showcases everything that you need to know about the project and also has the upcoming February 23rd training that I highly recommend that you all attend. It's gonna be more in depth than what I've provided today. And it's gonna go into the grid square survey project, how to get, how to adopt the grid squares and everything you need to know about the areas that have a grid square. Um, and you can register for that right here on their website. And the page shows you step by step how you can volunteer. Again, first step is creating an IMAP account. And then uh, you're going to need your IMAP personal ID, which I'll show you how to get that in a minute. Tells you how to uh, select a grid square and prepping for surveying has a nice little video you can watch and lots of resources for spotted lanternfly in Tree of Heaven on the page. And down at the bottom is where you actually adopt the grid square. So to adopt a grid square, you hit launch sign up map. And it's pretty self explanatory from here. But again, that February 23rd webinar is going to give you way more details. Um, you can type in a specific address, like say you wanted to know if there's something near your house. Um, we could just do what town is everybody in? Is it in Can are you all in Canton? Or most of you in Canton? Uh every, there's all over the the map as far as who's on the web. I'm just gonna throw that in there <laughs> just to give you an example. So you can type in <clears throat> Canton. All right, so what towns other Tree of he Heaven is lavender and the known public land is blue. Okay. So I'm just up in your neck of the woods here, just checking it out. So there are no confirmed um, SLF infestations or presence up in your region is all that that is saying. And that's a good thing, but it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means maybe we haven't found it yet. Uh, but there is confirmed tree of heaven in the area, which is the lavender, it said. Lavender. That looks blue to me. Nope, oh, that's public Russia. land. And so, so just so that you can recognize them when you see them. Say that again. No, I didn't hear your question. Um. Oops, I guess I, this should have as the heading. I can't hear anything. I wonder if somebody was unmuted. 
Um, okay. Sorry. Really asking a question. Okay. Well, I'm not sure what they're asking, but anyway, so you can click on different grid squares. You can claim the grid square here. Um, and as mentioned, you need your IMAP ID and they give you instructions right here. It's very easy to find. <clears throat> so remember when I was first logging in and I hit that little dash up in the top left-hand corner, you hit that and then this is what opens up and you hit your account. Okay. And then once you do that, your person ID is right there under your account. And then that's all you need to sign up. I lost myself. So you're, you would put that ID here, your email, your first name, your last name, and then you claim it. And then you've claimed the grid square. And as mentioned, the training on the 23rd is going to go in more depth of what to expect, um, how to retrieve the grid squares that you've that you've claimed so you can uh, put together a strategy for surveillance with your team or you know plan for yourself. All of that will be discussed on the February 23rd webinar. Does anybody have questions about the information that I've just shared before I show you how to use the mobile, the IMAP mobile app? There's been some chat kind of back and forth with um, who's active within the IMAP Invasives network. Uh, it looks like the uh, network includes Arizona, Kentucky, Maine, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and Saskatchewan. Is somebody answering the question or are they asking me the question? <laughs> Yes, and I and I put that in there just so yeah that. yeah so I I was right that long list that came up under the jurisdiction it was just longer than I remember it being in the past is all um, that appears to be all of the states that have lists in which you can utilize while uh, making an observation in in the IMAP database portal and I can direct everybody to Mitch O'Neill who is. Uh, the contact person for IMAP to answer any technical specific IMAP questions and I will include his contact information in the follow up email because he will be just better probably explain he knows where all the resources are. Um, and someone asked uh, they're in the lower Hudson prism area, uh, who is the contact down there and I did put in the lower Hudson prism. Uh, web page. The contact for for IMAP or for the PRISM network? Uh, Brent. Brent is the contact for the Lower Hudson. Um, oh, I'm not. <laughs> no, Brent is the one who was asking. Yeah, I was the one that was asking. I oh, guess just, um, the guy's uh, name is Brent, though. <laughs> yes, yeah. I am not the contact. <laughs> no, but the contact person his name is Brent <laughs> so yeah are so are you asking for the prism network contact or for IMAP for IMAP it's Mitch O'Neill for all of New York State yeah I, I guess I guess the, the the prism network was what I was kidding yeah. was curious about yeah oh my dog's barking at you yeah I can put the prism network information in a follow-up email for everybody okay great does anybody have questions about the network so I mentioned earlier that there are eight prisms that span the whole state of New York uh, so each county will have a prism uh, available to them to help with uh, invasive species awareness, to give guidance on management, and so on and so forth. We act as an information hub. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to stop sharing my this screen and but. Would everybody mind just telling me in the chat? I gotta open the chat. Um, is anybody gonna be using the mobile app? I'm trying to find my chat. Oh, there it is. Do we? Do you want to see how to use it? Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Back to 
Oh goodness. Bear with me here. I'm trying to um, share my screen here. There we go. Yes, screen share. Okay, so you should see my phone now. I have lots of apps. So this is what the mobile, the IMAP app looks like down here. Uh, to download the app, it's free. So on your mobile device, you go into your, you know, Google Play or App Store and you just type in IMAP app and it should pop right up and it will have this logo here with the leaf and the, it looks like an Asian longhorn beetle to me um, in the logo. So that's the app. And again, you need to have, all right, I guess we can refresh. Uh, you need to have an IMAP account for this to work. Okay. And first things first, you go to the three dashes on the top left and hit preferences. And again, that question that's been asked, you pick the state jurisdiction that you want to work in. I'm going to choose New York. Um, you use your credentials, the email you use and the password that you use to create your account here. Um, if you have not created an account yet, the app will prompt you to do so. As you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but right here, if you click on that, it'll bring you right to that login screen that I showed each of you earlier. And then you can make an account there. Um, and then if you're making a new account, a very crucial step is checking your email that you use to sign up with, because you'll get a confirmation email to just confirm that yes, that's your email and you are you. No, nothing's going to work until you click on the link inside of that email, I believe. So make sure you do that. Um, and then you can do retrieve IMAP lists. That is just gonna make sure that the list is appropriate to the state that you're in. Uh, you can toggle between scientific and common names. This is kind of fun if you're trying to brush up on your scientific names to do that. And one of the biggest features of this area of the app is the customized species list. So if you open that up, so the New York State species list is quite extensive, as you can see here. So what is a good thing to do is what if you're going out to look for spotted lanternfly, for example, before your survey, go ahead and set your species list to spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. I always have fake on because I do a lot of trainings. Um, because as you can see, it's very time consuming and you don't want to have to do this every time um, you are doing a survey. And we got to get all the way down to the S's. Spotted lantern fly. Where are you? There you are. Okay, spotted lantern fly. And then tree of heaven. Tree of heaven. Okay then hit okay. And that's gonna make it so you don't have to go through that long list every time you're making an observation. And then you just leave everything else at the default. Oh, you'll wanna have your um, GPS tracking on on your phone. And oftentimes you can turn, turn that on or enable that in your just your regular phone settings. It should be right in there. And again, this project area is gonna pop up. And unless some of you have joined the network previously, you likely won't see anything here. But as you can see, I'm part of a lot of projects, but whatever projects you're part of will come up there. I just chose the um, spotted lantern fly one. And then you just, um, if you don't like the welcome instructions that show up, remember earlier when I first opened it, there was a bunch of like writing and arrows and stuff. If you don't like that, you can turn it off. And then you just hit, Save. All right, so then you're ready, you're ready for action. So to make an observation, you hit the top right hand button there. And then you can take a photo or you can select a photo from a library. This is a fake species. So I'll take a picture of my cat. Hi, Coltrane. Okay. 
Hit OK. Or if you have some in your library, you can you can do that. So someone asked earlier uh, in the app, you can't upload multiple images, but on the desktop version, I believe you make the original observation and upload the photo and then you go back in to the observation. Uh, remember how I showed you after you could edit by clicking on the little link that comes up in that box. And then from there, I believe is where you add more photos. Uh, okay, and then you do <clears throat> custom list. You can see here, there's a way to toggle custom list on and off. If it's checked, when you hit the species selection area, only what you've checked will show up instead of that really long list. So we've checked, oh, I've checked a few things, but there's spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. Um, I'm just gonna hit fake species. And um, then below it is species detected, species not detected. So this is gonna be really important for the, the spotted lanternfly survey project because if you don't find something in your grid, grid square we, we definitely want to know just as much as we want to know if you do find something uh, because it'll just help us keep track of where we've searched and where we have or have not found things so you just check there i'm going to hit not detected because we're just doing a test and then you'll see the map here so it's showing me where i am rutland center because that's where my office home office is if it's not right you can move um zoom in and out and move that little pin or flag in a different location with your finger or you can type in you know gps coordinates if this says zero zero here that means that your uh, gps locator is not on on your phone and again, you have to go into your regular, like your phone settings and just enable GPS tracking, I think is what it's called. Uh, special projects, and you likely might not be part of an organization, but if you are or want to become one, you can request to be. And that just helps with querying the observations for those organizations and projects in an easier way. You can type in time search. This is really helpful for volunteers uh, because many organi organizations do track the time of their volunteers for various reasons. Uh, so, you know, I spent 30 minutes. You could just type in, you know, how many minutes you spent in your surveying. And also you could do comments. You could talk about maybe uh, a landmark or something that helps identify the location that you're in, for example or any other relevant information that you find useful. And then you just hit save. And then you see there's these little cards that show up um, in the space down here. These are all just tests I've done for training mostly. Um, <laughs> what were you gonna ask? No, oh, okay. So you're not done yet. This is just um, step, the initial steps to actually upload the observation to the IMAP database that I showed you earlier where, where we got in the map and you saw all those hexagons and whatnot come up. That won't happen for your observation um, for the unconfirmed observations until you check mark it and then you hit the three lines in the top left and then upload selected. Once you do that, then your observation is considered an uploaded unconfirmed observation that for the spotted lanternfly project you will um whomever is leading that project will get the email saying that someone in their project has uploaded an observation for the species of concern and then they will have that record with the photographs and the details that you've given and then they can look at it confirm it they could go to the site, check things out and make a confirmation. And then once they make the confirmation that it is in fact what you thought it was, then it goes onto the IMAP public map as a confirmed observation that you and others like myself can do a filter for on that map and extract that data and that information and use it to just put together a management strategy for the species of concern or to aid uh, early detection efforts of volunteers and so on and so forth.
Uh, if you want to edit, you just hit the little pencil and it just opens it back up and you can make whatever edits you need to make. Okay, so that is the tutorial for IMAP. I'm going to just get off my phone there. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen to, or I've already stopped sharing my screen. Okay, so I guess we could just open up to just an open discussion, dialogue, any questions that you may have. Uh, I have a few questions for you, for the group. How many of you are planning to join the statewide effort to search for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven? If you're interested in doing that, maybe just type yes in the chat box or feel free to come off of mute and talk if you'd like. Okay, so quite a bit. And yeah, the slides, everything that I talked about today is going to be shared, including the recording, the slides, and every link that you would need um, for all of the resources to become involved in the Spotted Lanternfly Tree of Heaven statewide adoptive grid survey project, and also to become part of SLILO's Spotted Lanternfly Monitoring Project, which is just an extension of um, the statewide effort. In Megan, region. I've got a question. Um, <clears throat> how much information is too much information? Because yeah, there's uh, a lot I, of information. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> I'm I'm in I'm in the Hudson Valley, um, just southeast of Poughkeepsie, um, and <clears throat> I'm a forester down here and an arborist. And 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 on on most properties that I operate on, Tree of Heaven's present. Um, you know, it's not uncommon whatsoever. It's, it's all over the place. Um, so, you know, should, should I even be thinking about, you know, reporting whatever I see it, uh, because that seems like a lot of information for the system is really not going to tell us too much. Um, <clears throat> so that's question okay. number one. And, and, and question number two, uh, I see that, you know, spotted lantern fly has been confirmed in Orange County, which is to our West and also Fairfield County, which is to our East. I'm amazed that it hasn't been confirmed in Dutchess County. Uh, so, you know. Yeah, let me go to there and actually, okay. Yeah, let me go actually, let me show you one more resource. Let me find it first. So the answer to question number one is, I don't think there's too much information, especially for, for this project. Uh, the way you report it, instead of doing, you know, 15 individual points, you could do, remember earlier when I showed on IMAP that you could do um, a buffer. A buffer zone, do, yeah, I saw that. You could yep. Do, yep. Yeah, so you could do points, individual points, you could do a line, which would be, say you have like a row of trees, you could draw a line from where the first one was straight through or something like that. Right. Um, and you can also do polygons. So you could get in the, in the general area. So if you're using the app, it's more accurate because you're there with the GPS tracking going on and it automatically will put your location of where you're at. But if you're using the desktop version, like later on, um, you'll have to zoom into the area. Um, it's helpful to take GPS coordinates so you can get into the area and then you'll have to zoom in and change maybe the different layers of IMAP, which I can show you how to do that in a minute. Um, to get a good pinpoint area of where, where you've made your observation. Okay. Um, but you can make multiple observations using the mobile app. It just, you just pick instead of point, you'll just do um, the multi observation option. Right. Okay. Or do a polygon. Makes sense. Yeah. There's just different. It just depends on what you're trying to report. Uh, okay. So then I just wanted to show you, you made me think of this. Okay. So this will also be in your follow-up email. This is just the, sorry, my dog is hearing people talking quiet. <clears throat> this is the New York State IPM website and this is the map. So that's where I got that screenshot. I just mm. zoomed in to here. So this is updated frequently. You can come here anytime and see what you can zoom in. And there, the view is a little bit nicer than what I had on my screen. 
So the blue are the known infestations or the confirmed infestations in New York State, well, in the United States, but these ones are in New York here. And then the other ones, like the purple dots, they indicate areas where individual fines occurred, whether those fines were an adult or an egg mass, dead or alive. Uh, we would have to talk to ag and markets to get those type of details, but there's a difference between the infestation and the individual fines. Okay, right. Okay. So, and then you'll notice the map also has like uh, this red line here for Pennsylvania. So these ones are like internal, like internal, I think is what they call it, um, quarantine. So inside of the state, they're not letting transport of any materials that they think SLF might go on between this area and that area and surrounding states. Does that make sense? But in New York, yeah. it's where the ag and markets is diligently enforcing the movement of materials that SLF may be on from outside the state into the state, but not at this time between these two bordering areas at this time. So that's that's how you read the map. And yes, I agree with you. So as mentioned, it's it's easily spread by people and most of it's the transportation. So uh, Slilo and other PRISMs and partners across the state have been really brainstorming and collaborating on education and outreach because it's gonna be vital to the success of containing the spread of spotted lanternfly in New York. And we do stand to lose you know, millions of dollars. The DEC website has uh, a, a stat in there it's like $354 million and we stand to lose in just apple and grape yield um, alone for that industry. And that's just those two, uh, not to mention the devastation that could happen to the forests because like I said, they, they attack so many different plants. Um, and, and, and this yeah. and this and this critter is a sucking insect, correct? I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a plant it's huh, different, different than you know, like uh, emerald ash borer, which is a you know cambium it's feeder boring. that came yeah. through quick and devastated devastated a lot of forest cover. But you know, I mean, uh, I guess you know, give me give me some idea on your take on the on the severity of of how it's going to impact. I mean, you mentioned sugar maple and, and black walnut as a couple of preferred hosts. You know, those are obviously, you know, fairly important, you know, timber trees to the industry in the, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the lower Hudson region. Uh, so, you know, those, those could be, you know, logs that could go out of the area, could go out of the country, could be processed here. So, you know, I guess that's what I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on is, you know, is this something that, you know, we should be alerting landowners to and, adjusting, you know, adjusting harvest, you know, plans too, or, or are we, are we at that stage that we need to worry about? Well, we're on high alert right now. Uh, <clears throat> as for, I, I can't speak on, on any crop planning because that's not my expertise. Mm -hmm. The ag and markets would be the folks to talk about. And I will include the contact information for the lead SLF people for that for you okay. to ask that yeah. specific question. But at this time, the whole state has been asked all of the, you know, the PRISM network, for example, parks, ag and markets, DC, everybody has asked us to all reach out to the public and our partners, our colleagues, everybody, and ask them all to please help keep an eye out for spotted lanternfly, adults, nymphs, eggs, signs of infestation and tree of heaven. And during the winter, what we need to look for are the eggs that I showed. And I can show that picture again, um, if that's helpful. And it will be, information will be in your follow-up email. And I, again, I highly encourage you to please go to the February 23rd webinar because the, those are the people, ag and markets are gonna be there. You know, the IMAP folks, parks, everybody that's involved in this are gonna be there and they will be able to answer these more um, in-depth questions because they have the expertise on those Good. things. Good. Yeah, I am more, I know what spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven look like and mm -hmm. I know what resources are there for you to learn more and get involved. 
Megan, while you're on this, uh, the New York State IPM website, would you be able to click on, click on that insecticides for use on spotted lanternfly? Yeah, there's a we, lot of different things here. Yep, yeah, we had a couple of questions in the the chat about um, what's um, what's it you what are you able to use in New York State specifically? Yeah, that's right here, and I am not. Um, knowledgeable on the pesticides. So I won't be able to answer a lot of questions, but other than give you this resource and give you a contact to somebody who can. So I don't know if we want to get into this because I won't really be able to talk about it. <laughs> well, I think that they just wanted that information. Where could they find that? So that's at the, the New York State Integrated Pest Management website that is- Yeah, um, and I have that written down. Um, I, I'm constructing a very in-depth follow-up email for all of you. So um, I will write that down here just to make sure that I put a, an exact link, not just the link to this website. So you have to look for it, but I'll put the insecticide link. And that's on that, uh, the website that's- yeah, for New York State I, IPM Spotted Lanternfly website. We also just had another question in the chat about um, where the data points are coming from. Which, are, we, are, they watch, are you watching iNaturalist and EDD maps for data? Wait, what? Um, We're using IMAP invasives to get the data. Is that what they're asking? Uh, they, they, I just literally read what they asked. Are you watching iNaturalist and EDD maps for data? So for New York State, IMAP invasives is New York State's uh, database for invasive species observation and treatment reports. So we're, we're asked to use IMAPs rather than the others. Um, someone is like lawn mowing or like snow blowing or something. <laughs> It looks like uh, it's oh. like shop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's what we're using. Um, and again, this will be a great question for the IMAP team because I've heard in meetings and just being in the in this network that uh, there is integration of available for data on those those other platforms like EdMaps and um, iNaturalist. I just know that there's an extra step that their team has to take to get that data. And from my understanding, it can be somewhat time consuming. So what we're asking for, for you on the phone today and others moving forward is to please use the, the IMAP Invasives platform for this project. Oh, they think that, um... One invasive insect, it might have been SLF uh, in Quebec, came from someone that made an observation on the iNaturalist. Yeah, like I said, um, I'm sure that it's my understanding that the IMAP team and other agencies that are involved in this are aware that there are multiple platforms being used and that they're doing what they need to do to get that data. Uh, but we are asking folks to use IMAP invasives if, if they're able to, which hopefully you would be able to do that um, moving forward for the, for the project. But I, mean, I like iNaturalist just as much as anybody else and all the other apps as well. But uh, the system here that I've shared uh, is already, that, so there's grid squares that have already been put in place here. So right here, there's one kilometer grid squares across the state that have been put together strategically already in the IMAP database platform, that map that I showed you earlier. So that's why they want you to use IMAP. One of the reasons why. And there was another question. Do you know if there will be a continuing education uh, credits for the um, webinar on the 23rd. Let's find out. Oh, look at there we are. Why is my logo green? <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Where is it? 23rd.
don't see it advertised, but that does not mean that there isn't. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but is there a way for those seeking those credits to ask for the credits themselves or no? Like if they get confirmation that they went to this? I think they can. Um... I can ask the, the IMAP team if they're going to have credits or not, but I don't see it listed here. And I'm not the one that put together this webinar, so I'm not able to answer the question. Would we ask somebody at... Um... I'll, I could ask. Um, you, would, you would reach out to Mitch O'Neill, which I'll put his information. He's the IMAP representative that you would be reaching out to that could talk on that more. But I would... I would feel like it would be something that would be relatively easy for them to get, but I just, um, I don't see it listed here, so. I'm just trying to go back. Um, so if somebody is in Massachusetts and they're asking if they have to wait until Massachusetts joins in with IMAP invasives. Um, yeah. So that wasn't one of the ones that was listed. Um, no, and they have, so on the, the, um, the IMAP website, it has inactive members um, and Massachusetts isn't right. there. But oh, they, is. I mean, they're along the border, so it's, I mean, if they're- So is the person who, who is asking this question? I have questions for you, because I want to understand this. <laughs> uh, looks hey, like- it was me. Um, who, So are you, it says Massachusetts here. So are you saying that you tried to use the IMAP and you can't use it? Or what are you saying? No, no. Just, uh, you know, if I wanted to, you know, register and start using an IMAP in Massachusetts, would it, is there any point to it? You know? Oh, for the, are you asking about like the grid square survey? Yeah, I'm becoming. Oh, you okay. Know, okay, about, I understand what you're saying now. At least I think I knew. Okay. Yeah. No, you can still, you can, anybody can report to IMAP invasives at any point in time. Um, and from any place? From any place, yeah. As long, I mean, as long as it, it's my understanding, as long as it's, you've got this jurisdiction here, because for you to report it, you have to choose a species that comes up on the list, right? So you just choose the state that you want their, sorry, I pushed the wrong thing. The jurisdiction, the state, if, or the area, if you will, Yeah. that you're, wanting the list from and then you pick one and then you and then you get that list so as long as that happens you can report it uh so actually now i'm curious about something as well if they've made a special project for <clears throat> the grid square I'm putting it in the wrong spot. I apologize. That's not what I meant to do. Oh, and that's my project. So the DC and then the New York State IPM, that's something that I actually didn't think to ask um, to the IMAP team if they're gonna have their own special project or not. So that could be something that you could do. I will ask them about that because I just don't see it here unless they've named it something that I'm not typing in, um, but I'm assuming Spotted Lanternfly would be in the name. <laughs> uh, I could find out if they're gonna have their own special project for it. And if folks outside of New York state, but in bordering areas that wanted to contribute data, if they're wanting that or not. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, yeah. So far there's the only Spotted Lanternfly they fly that they found in Massachusetts were a couple of dead ones. <laughs> so in a way that's good news. Yeah, that's what we found at first too. They had to be alive at one point in time though, probably though. So yeah. They, they were brought in on nursery stock. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
but did that answer your question? I can get more information on that on what, yeah, yeah, what words, folks yeah. that want to participate in IMAP if, for spotted lanternfly in bordering states, like how they can do so. Yeah, if, if I happen to see some live ones, I can record it you know, on IMAP. Did you hear that? What? If I see live ones in Massachusetts, I can go ahead and report it on the IMAP mm -hmm. uh, app. Yeah, you can report it. My question for them is going to be, is there a project that bordering states observations could or should be reported to? Or if you just make an observation without reporting it to a project, which you can always do that. You don't have to pick a project. I was just letting folks know that are in like the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario region in those five counties I talked about earlier. Um, Lewis, St. Lawrence, Jefferson, Oneida and Oswego. In those counties, we do have our own volunteer surveillance network that we are promoting for spotted lanternfly and other species of concern that you can become a part of. And if you're gonna be monitoring for spotted lanternfly as part of our network, like the SLILO network, you can go ahead and choose a spotted lanternfly monitoring as, a, as your project. Um, but I am gonna find out if there's gonna be a statewide project that we're we should just have everyone use instead for this mm -hmm. moving forward any clarification on that okay thanks megan yep any other questions because we are at time so we're getting a little close but i'm i'm still available for a few more minutes if folks have questions I'm just trying to go back through, make sure we covered. Yeah, I'm not seeing, I think we've got, I think we covered all the questions that were in the chat. Yeah, and just give me time to um, put together the email. Um, if folks want to throw things into the chat right now, uh, resources or contacts that you want me to put in the email, um, I'll capture them. I'll just copy and paste them right from the chat. Um, but for the most part, I'm including everything that I showed you today. Um, Megan, stuff. I'd like to mention something that we had uh, questions on chemical uh, controls. Um, it's a, there's an extensive list, but one that the homeowner or non-professional could possibly try uh, would be Carbaryl. Uh, that would be a contact insecticide. Uh, it has a uh, listed as having excellent activity against SLF and uh, the residual activity is good. Carborel, the other name for it is seven, S-E-V-I-N. Uh, yeah, as long as it's certified, I mean, if it's labeled for the use, it's my understanding that if you're going to do chemical application, you have to First, the chemical has to be approved for use in New York State, if you're going to use it in New York, and then it has to be approved for use in the way that you want to use it. So as long as those align, um, then you should be well, good. It's, but used, it's used extensively in New York State. It's part of a, a fruit tree sprays. Okay. Yeah, I will definitely include um, contact information for uh, chemical treatment options, but there are other options for control as well. Um, that, I mean, might not be as effective, but um, I can include the information from the Spotted Lanternfly webpage I showed you, the New York State IPM website. That's where the information comes from. Um, and I'll give you their contact because they are the ones that can speak more on the chemical requirements because I, it's also my understanding it from conversations with these folks is that because they do, it is an agricultural pest that there's different 
a lot of different um, regulations that are in place for application on agricultural crops. So it's a little bit different than just other species where, you know, that attack just one tree or one thing. The chemical application requirements are different is my understanding. And Megan, that New York State IPM uh, link does have a, a downloadable uh, spreadsheet which lists all of the approved, um, both commercial and home garden uh, insecticides. Yeah, I noticed that. I just didn't open it because I just, um, I am not the person to talk about for chemical application. <laughs> So I didn't open it, but yeah, there's a lot in there. So that resource is already available and it already explains um, in the resource what you can use it on and what you can use it for. So this is gonna be your document here. And the contact people, I will put their contact information in the follow-up email but there's a lot of information here. But there are people out there that educate you on how to understand this information. So it may look overwhelming, but it's, don't be overwhelmed. There's people out there that are here to help. And if you're in New York State, you wanna, um, and have a question, just contact your local Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, somebody within that extension association or the region will be able to answer those questions for you. Yep. All right. Well, I'm very, very happy that everybody um, who joined us today was able to join. And even for those who intended to join and couldn't, they will also receive the follow-up email and the resources and hopefully uh, be inspired to join this effort and help stop or help spot spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>